So, today we start the last day of our six-week series, Heaven, Your Question Answered. Uh, I thought everybody was going to go, oh. Well, I left the, you know, I left it there for you. You missed it. Okay. I hope that you've received a lot from uh, these series of messages, and I hope that it's been something that, uh, one, has got you excited about uh, eternity, that, uh, you know, death is just the beginning. And uh, when we finally, God calls each one of us home, that we're going to start eternity in his presence. And I hope that these past uh, five weeks coming into the sixth week have been very uh, informative for you. Um, Starting next week, we're going to start a new series. It's a seven-part series, and it's called Scandalous. We've got to, like, say that better than that, right? Like, Scandalous, right? Something like that. We're going to talk about some uh, people or events in the Bible uh, that remind us that these patriarchs in the Bible aren't quite as squeaky clean as we would like to believe that they are. And uh, you know that God uses imperfect people to spread a perfect gospel of love amen so but these weeks we've been talking about heaven and we've answered these questions over these past few weeks what is heaven like who's in heaven right now will we know each other in heaven and what will we do in heaven and heaven's a place where we are all confident we're going to go when we die Let's be honest, even the folks who uh, say they'd rather spend eternity in hell, they're like, I'm fine, don't worry about it, you're going to have heaven, I'm going to be in hell. The reality is, their idea of hell is a lot like heaven, right? It's just a place without any rules, and you get to do whatever you want, right? And people believe that hell will be an endless party where sex, drugs, and rock and roll are going to be on the menu every day for eternity and eternity in eternity and you know what it's hot but you know what florida's hot i adjusted to that so it'll be fine before i can end this series properly i need to dispel some rumors about hell now here's what we're going to do today we're going to do something i haven't done in years there are no handouts today i want you to just listen I want you to just focus. Now, if you're like me and you've got to take notes, grab your bulletin. You can scribble some stuff down. But I want you to just kind of focus in on what we're talking about today. F- before we start this message on how can I be sure I'm going to heaven, let me dispel some rumors about hell. The first is this, is that hell's going to be fun. Woohoo! Let me read from the Message Bible. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says this, Those who refuse to know God and refuse to obey the message will pay for what they've done. Eternal exile for the presence of the Master and His splendid power is their sentence. Now, notice what this says. That those who refuse to accept God's message will be exiled from, exiled from His presence. Just as heaven is a choice, so too is hell. I want to point out that the folks fail to realize that there is nothing good, nothing joyful, there is no laughter or fun apart from God. The idea that we'll just party in hell is an impossibility. Whatever is joy or goodness, and and if you've ever experienced that in your life, it originated from God. James chapter 1 verse 17 says whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. Hell will be a place that is the absence of goodness. There will never be a moment of fun or joy or happiness. And also notice that hell will be a place where God's power will not be available to help. The second myth I'd like to talk about this morning is this, is that the devil's going to rule hell. Woohoo! Right? Revelation 20, 10 explains what the devil's going to be doing. Then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan's going to be kind of busy. 
I need you to know this morning that Satan is not going to be running an eternal kager in hell. Satan will be tormented forever and ever and ever. He will receive no relief and he will rule over nothing. And the third myth is this, is that hell is not real. I mean, come on, right? We'll talk about God's part in this more. The third myth is heaven, or excuse me, hell is not real. They, those who have rejected God, will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life, Matthew 25, 46. Jesus said this, don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son. And then in Revelation, it says, then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. And this lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Hell is not mythical. According to the same Bible where we get the description of heaven, we also receive numerous glimpses of hell. I need you to understand this this morning. We love to accept the Bible's version of heaven, but we reject the Bible's version of hell. Can't have it both ways. One can't, the Bible can't be true and false. It doesn't work that way. It's either all true or it's all a lie. Hell will be the absence of anything good. It will not be ruled by that great party animal, Satan. And we can be absolutely sure that hell is a real place. I say these things not because I want to start off my sermon with a real high. And I don't say this to scare anyone. Although it should be a sober thought. Ecclesiastes 7.4 says the wise person thinks about, excuse me, thinks a lot about death while a fool thinks only about having a good time i don't say these things to scare anyone i say these things so we're aware of the reality that exists the truth is we can't have an honest discussion about heaven without any mention of hell it would be intellectually and spiritually negligent on my part there's nova Nova's having a moment, <laughs> but he's cute. Okay, he's allowed to. The rest of you can't do that. So having said that, the question I'd be asking myself at this point is how do I avoid hell and make sure that my reservation is secure for heaven? And that's our subject matter today. How can I be sure that I'm going to heaven. As I've told you these past six weeks, heaven will satisfy your deepest longings, surpass your wildest imagination, and exceed your greatest fantasies. Heaven will not disappoint. Now here's what I want you to realize this morning. God has made it easy for you to go to heaven. He already did the hard part when he sent his son to die on the cross for you. He paid the price so that your sins would be forgiven and that you could stand before God in heaven. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. We need to know this morning that there is no other way to share in all the joys and wonders that we have discussed these past six weeks. It's only through acknowledging that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he lived a sinless life. That he died on the cross and rose again from the dead three days later. It is our declaration that he is Lord. And through living a life that honors the sacrifice he made on our behalf, that we can be assured that we we will spend eternity in heaven. Jesus also said this in John chapter 10, verse 9. He said, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Jesus is not only the way, he's also the door or the gate to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to go through the gate marked Jesus Christ. There's no other entrance. Now, if you've heard the term saved, right? And you wonder what that means, all these saved people. 
It means that we're saved from eternal separation from God. We are saved from eternal separation from goodness. We are saved from this place called hell that we just talked about. In 1981, a Minnesota radio station reported a story about a stolen car in California. Police were staging an intense search for the vehicle and the driver, even to the point of placing announcements on the local radio stations to contact the thief. And here's why. Because on the front seat of the stolen car sat a box of crayers, cr uh, crackers excuse me, that unknown to the thief were laced with poison. The car owner had placed those crackers on the seat there because he intended to take them home as rat bait. Now the police and the owner of the stolen car were more interested in apprehending the thief to save his life than to recover the car. I want you to know today that God is pursuing you, not to punish you, but to save you. The reality is that we've allowed ourselves to believe lies from Satan that confuse us. And so this morning, I want to talk about a couple of lies from Satan. First of all, the first lie that I want to talk about this morning is this. Because God is good, he could never send anyone to hell. How could a good God send people to hell? Now, there's two reasons why this statement is wrong. The first one is this, that God sends people to hell. Wrong. I want you to know this morning, God does not send people to hell. God has never sent anyone to hell. Everyone who will be in hell has made that choice for themselves. God never sent a single person to hell. If this were true, then why would God provide the most precious jewel from heaven to come to earth and live and die as a common man? Here's the truth. We find in 1 Peter 3, 9, he, God, does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Another version puts it this way, God would that none should perish. The second lie is that a good God cannot allow people to suffer for this, the decisions that they've made. In other words, how could a good God allow people to go to heaven, or to, excuse me, to hell? And the problem with this argument is also twofold. The first part of this, this, this question is, what is good? When we talk about good, how do we quantify good? The book that uh, Kyle talked about this morning, please, if you haven't read that book, read that book. It's a great read on how good is good enough. And I don't have the time to unpack this completely. But I want you to know this. Goodness does not mean weakness. Now we know as parents, good parents set boundaries for their children. Why? To protect them. Bad parents either don't set boundaries or don't enforce the boundaries that they set. It goes something like this. Johnny, if you cross that line, you're going to have a five-minute timeout. They cross the line and we go, ha, 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 ha. And the problem with that is one day they're going to run out into traffic and we go, stop, Johnny. And they go, ha, ha, ha. We set boundaries for our children for their protection, right? That's good parenting. A good God sets boundaries for his children for our protection. We see parents who don't want their rules for their children. A couple of weeks ago, how many of you read the story about the great Pez egg Easter egg hunt? You haven't read the story about the Pez Easter egg hunt? It's going to go down in the annals of Easter egg history. A couple of weeks ago, right here, just up the street from us, at the Pez factory, they had 400 people who came to, with their children, right, to, uh, to go on an Easter egg hunt. It didn't take long, and this Easter egg hunt fell into chaos. Because mommies and daddies and grandmas and grandpas thought that their child deserved all the eggs. Now listen, 
parents were knocking children out of the way and stealing eggs out of other children's baskets so Johnny and Susie could have all. And the kids who were, the kids who were younger were supposed to have one section, and the kids who were older were supposed to have another section, but all the parents of the older kids let them run amok over the younger kids so they could have Easter eggs. Rules don't apply to my children. Anarchy and chaos. Was that good? It was good for those kids, right? They got everything they wanted. And I wonder this morning, how then can a good God not protect the boundaries that were established for our safety? God is good because he enforces the boundaries, not because he treats us as spoiled children who get whatever we want. There's a second problem with the God should allow everyone to go to heaven argument. And that's this, that God is not only good, he's also just. And we choose to forget this fact. And here's what this means. It means that justice in its truest form means that uh, although we get to make our own decisions, that's called free will. And we all love free will, don't we? Amen? Amen? We also get the rewards or consequences of our decisions. See, God cannot act unjustly. As incapable as it is for God to sin, he's equally incapable of acting unjustly. Because God is just, sin cannot go unpunished. Proverbs 24, 12, I love this. Listen to this. Don't excuse yourself by saying, look, I didn't know. For God understands all hearts, and he sees you. He who guards your souls knows you knew. He will repay all people as their actions deserve. Now, we're all grown-ups here. We're all aware that we are sinners. We all understand that we have done things that God cannot excuse or overlook. And here's why, because there's no hidden motives from God. He knows you better than you know you, and he knows you better than anyone else knows you. And he alone can judge us justly. Here's the reality. Justice demands that every single one of us spends eternity in hell. That's justice. And let's be honest, there's not a single person in this room who lives up to God's standards. And you may be here and go, yeah, I do. Okay, well, let me tell you what God's standard is if you think you do. God's standard is absolute and complete holiness. Still live up to it? I don't. Holiness as it pertains to God is perfectly without sin. 1 Peter 1.16, God says you must be holy because I am holy. So if God's standard is holy, then if you're like me, you're thinking, that's impossible. There's no way. It's all stacked against us. There's no way on my best day. I don't go five minutes. And God says, I agree. You can't do it. You can't be holy on your own. And so God, because he is just, realizes that we cannot live up to that standard on our own. We need help. See, true justice could not condemn another for something they were incapable of doing. It'd be like you getting angry at your two-year-old for not driving you to church this morning. That's it, you're punished. You're on a timeout. You should have been able to reach the pedals. That's a you problem, not a me problem. And that's where Jesus comes in. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But, thank God, our high priest offered himself to God as the single sacrifice for sin, good 
for all time. And so through Jesus, the, holy, the holiness issue is resolved. But that brings up a whole new issue. How does this whole thing work? I mean, Jesus died for our sins to make us holy or right with God. So that's it. I'm in, right? Not quite. See, if that were the case, then all of mankind would have stopped sinning when Jesus died on the cross, right? And let's be honest, that wouldn't have been just either. In the same way your child has to do something for themselves, we too have to do something. I mean, We got ourselves into this mess all the way back in the Garden of Eden, right? Justice demands that we do something. Justice demands that we acknowledge what Jesus has done for us. And that's what's great about justice. It works both ways. 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful. And what's that word there? just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness parents have you ever made your child say sorry why did you do that to be mean to exercise your authority over them now you know who's boss to crush their little spirit of course not it's for them to understand that something has been given to them. And so they acknowledge and appreciate that they've been given something. And so they understand the value of the gift that they've received. Which brings us to the second big lie that we tend to believe from Satan. Namely, that all good people go to heaven. Nowhere in the entire Bible Does it say that good people go to heaven? I mean, I studied for four years in college. I took Hebrew. Don't ask me anything about it. I barely passed it, and I shouldn't have. (laughs) Gosh, I love that guy. And I've been a pastor for 20 years now, and I've yet to find that scripture. I haven't found the one that says all dogs go to heaven, and I haven't found the one that says all good people go to heaven. As a matter of fact, Mark 10, 18 does deal with this good issue. It says this, Jesus speaking, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. According to Jesus, who by the way is God, no one is good. None of us. And here, of course, is why no one's good. What's the measure of good? How do we quantify good? Is my good your good? How good is good enough? What is the good breaking line? And and, and isn't good always changing? I mean, it wasn't that long ago that here in America, slavery was good. In Rome, it was good for elite men to take advantage of young boys and young girls. There was a time in our history not so long ago that we thought it was good that our children recited the Pledge of Allegiance with the words, One Nation Under God. Now that's no longer good for our children. Good's constantly changing what's good and 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 how do we quantify good and ultimately who decides what's good see there's a belief by many that all good people go to heaven but what's good or what's good enough who decides if we're honest we'll admit that we're not very good at judging what's good Because ultimately, most of us judge ourselves as good, and then we judge others against our standard of goodness. We say things like, at least I'm not as bad as. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, you know, I'm no, that's bad, right? Or we say something like, (laughs) I'm better than You know what they do? You know what happens in their house? 
You know what he does after work? You know what she does on the weekends? This idea that good is good enough is a lie from Satan. And I might add, Satan dis- or Scripture describes Satan in John 8. Satan has always hated the truth. Because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And then the third lie this morning is that religion or good works can save me. Now, because we're starting to run out of time, I'm going to be brief here. But if religion and good works could save you, then why would Jesus need to die? Let me say that again. If religion or good works could save you, then what was the point of Jesus dying? Clearly, God promised, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on right relationship with God that comes by faith. Let me put that in 2016 vernacular. It was not based on his good works or his adherence to religious dogma. Verse 14, if God's promise is only for those who obey the law, live religious lives, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. So the promise is received by what? Let's try that again. So the promise is received by? One more time. The promise is received by? It's given as a free gift. And we are certain to receive it. So here's the point. Religion and being religious was never God's intention. What has always been his heart's desire is that we would know him personally. Adam and Eve in the garden, they went to church on Sunday. No. God's original intention was to walk with them in the cool of the evening. Personally. In relationship with them. And as far as good works go, Jesus called our good works filthy rags. What are filthy rags good for? Nothing. So if good isn't good enough and God and religion isn't good enough and a just God can't allow sin-filled people to go to heaven, how can I be sure that I'm going to heaven? Catch this this morning, because you need to know this. The fact is, God's not fair. God's not fair. He's loving. He's just. But I want you to hear it from me first this morning. God is not fair. Because Here's what's really cool about God. God has tipped the scales in our favor. And that's not fair. As a matter of fact, God is cheating for you. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Does that sound fair? You know, I love you guys. I love you very much. There's not one of you I'd give my son for. I mean that. If a person walked in here right now and put a gun to your head or my son's head, it's nice knowing you. If I had to choose, you're done. I'm not joking. I'm as serious as I can be. You're toast. Every single one of you. But not God. He loved you so much that he sent his son to die in your place. God has stacked the deck in our favor. Now, how can I be sure I'm going to heaven? Just itty bitty little thing we like to call grace. 
See how small it is on the screen? Itty bitty. It's a story told about Fiorello LaGuardia, who when he was the mayor of New York City during the worst days of the Great Depression and all of World War II, was called by adoring New Yorkers as the little flower because he was only five foot four and always wore a carnation in his lapel. He was a colorful character who used to ride the New York City fire trucks, raid speakeasies with the police department, take entire orphanages to baseball games. And whenever the New York newspapers were on strike, he would go on the radio and read the sunny, Sunday funnies to the kids. The story goes like this. One bitterly cold night in January of 1935, the mayor turned up at a night court that served the poorest ward of the city. LaGuardia dismissed the judge for the evening and took over the bench himself. Within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted her, her daughter was sick, and her two grandchildren were starving. But the shopkeeper from whom the bread was stolen refused to drop the charges. It's a real bad neighborhood, Your Honor, the, mayor, the man told the mayor. She's got to be punished to teach other people around here a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the woman and said, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail. But even as he pronounced the sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his pocket. <clears throat> he extracted a bill and tossed it into his famous sombrero saying, here's the $10 fine, which I now remit. And furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so their grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. So the following day, the New York City newspaper reported that $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered old lady who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. 50 cents of that amount, that amount being contributed by the red-faced grocery store owner. Well, some of the other petty criminals and people with traffic violations and New York policemen, each of whom had paid 50 cents for the privilege of doing so, gave the mayor a standing ovation. That's grace. Let me read you a second story this morning. Charles Spurgeon and Joseph Parker both had churches in London in the 19th century. On one occasion, Parker commented on the poor condition of children admitted into Spurgeon's orphanage. It was re it reported to Spurgeon, however, that Parker had criticized the orphanage itself. Spurgeon blasted Parker the next week from his pulpit. The attack was printed in the newspaper and became the talk of the town. People flocked to Parker's church the next Sunday to hear his rebuttal. When he stood up in the pulpit, he said, I understand Dr. Spurgeon is not in his pulpit today. And this is the Sunday they used to take an offering for the orphanage. I suggest we take a love offering here instead. The crowd was delighted. The ushers had to empty the collection plates three times. Lord, bring that to Shoreline Community Church. Later that week, there was a knock at Parker's study. Listen, it was Spurgeon. You know, Parker, you have practiced grace on me. You have given me not what I deserved. You have given me what I needed. That's grace. God's grace is that we don't get what we deserve. Instead, we get what we need we all know john 3 16 but let me read to you the next verse john 3 17 it says god sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him see justice would demand judgment judgment would demand death but god has withheld, withheld judgment and instead he has offered us grace Romans 5, 8 says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. One writer puts it this way. He says, what is grace? In the New Testament, grace means God's love in action towards men who merited the opposite of love. Grace means God moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger 
to save themselves. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. See, just like the kid who once given a gift must accept the gift and say thank you, God only requires the same from us. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and it's by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. And there are people who would say, it can't be that easy. It can't be that easy. And my response to that, Kathy, is why can't it? Why can't it be that easy? Why does it have to be difficult? Why does it have to be impossible? Why can't it be just that easy? But at the same time, let's notice what's said here. It's confessing that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Not a good man or a good teacher or even a smart guy with worthwhile precepts. Jesus did not say that he was one of many ways to God. He said he's the only way. See, we confess that he is Lord and believe that not only did he die, that would have made him a martyr, but that God raised him from the dead. And this is significant because confessing that he is Lord means that we make a declaration that we will no longer live for ourselves. Instead, he becomes Lord. That means that we strive to live life as he intended for us. No longer giving into our desires that lead us away from relationship with God, but living in a way that pleases him and draws us closer to the Father. And here's the secret His way has always been what's best for us. So how do we know how to live a life that pleases him? I don't have mine with me right here, but we grab our Bible and we begin to read it. God has laid it all out. All the answers are there. The other way we find out how to live a way that pleases him, look around. You find these people here and you find someone who's a little farther along in the way and you say, Help me out. I got some questions. And I got to say something else here about the Christian life because everybody thinks it's about a bunch of don'ts. I got to stop doing this. I got to stop doing that. I'm never going to have fun again. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. I don't know anywhere in the Bible it says where we have to live like monks. Right? Right? There are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And that doesn't matter if you're a Christian, if you're not, quite frankly. There are just things that are right and wrong. And you know that long before you ever accept Christ as Lord. Yeah, there's a difference that has to be made in our life. But you know what? I say this all the time, and if you're new, if you've been here a long time, you've heard this a bunch of times, but that's all right. I love you. I didn't, I wasn't as committed to my wife when we first got married as I am now. And that's not to mean that I wasn't committed to her, just mean I didn't love her as deeply and as fully as I love her now. You know why I love her more now than I did when we first got married? Because I know her better. I've spent time with her. There's history here now. We've gone through life together. And my love for her is much deeper than it was at first. So you know what? Just starting the relationship let it grow let it grow what all this means is that we are now able to have a relationship with this perfect god who loves us and this relationship with god gives us eternal access to this place that we've been talking about the last six weeks as pastor this way comes philippians chapter three wraps all of this up for us here's what it says yes Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law, being religious. Rather, I become righteous through, what's that word? Faith. In Christ, for God's way of making us right with Himself depends on faith. 
You have to just trust him that it's right. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him sharing in his death so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection of the dead. And here it is. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. I want you to know this morning that you're not going to become a citizen of heaven when you die. You are a citizen of heaven today if you've made him Lord. There's a dwelling place in heaven that has your name on it now. I don't know who does it, but somebody's cleaning it for you. We're going to close in a few minutes with a verse that we've said each week. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is there. Jesus is there. And he's made the way clear for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we have this blessed hope that one day you are going to come and receive us to yourself. Whether we die or we're reunited with you in the rapture. We know this, that heaven is as real as the sea we're sitting on right now. Because you said so. And you've never lied to us. You keep your promises. I pray this morning that if there's anybody in the sound of my voice who may be new to Shoreline Community Church or just, it's never come together for them. But today would be the day that they say, I want to start a relationship with Jesus. I want to make him Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you work in their hearts right now and that you do an eternal work. If you're here this morning, you've been listening to my message and this makes sense. Maybe for the first time you say, I have the faith to believe that Jesus is who he said he is. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And I want to make him Lord. I want to accept him. I want to confess this morning. morning you want to start a relationship with him just like so many others in this room this room is full of people who've done exactly what you're about to do they've asked christ to come into their life to purify them cleanse them from all that sin and to give them the assurance that they will spend eternity in heaven if that's you this morning and you'd like to pray a prayer with me as we close this morning would you just simply raise your hands that's me this morning. Thank you. God bless you. You put your hand down. Thank you. Anyone else? I want to be sure that I'm going to heaven. Thank you for that hand. Thank you. Amen. I'm going to ask that everybody join with me in this prayer. Please know this. The power is not in the prayer. The power is in you meaning what we say together. So whether you raised your hand or not, if you're here this morning, you, you are praying this prayer of salvation. Just believe this in your heart. Would you all repeat after me? Lord Jesus, I confess today that I need you. I need you to come into my life and cleanse me from all sin. I need you to help me to live a life that pleases the Father. I confess today that you died on the cross for my sin and that you were raised from the dead so that my sin problem would be erased. I thank you and I glorify you today. I accept today that I can't do this on my own but that I need you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give a hand to those that prayed that prayer?